okay for everyone? Definitely, I am okay, yes. Okay, so we'll get started. Welcome, everyone. Just switch I need the title. Oh, there's the title. Great. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this um, uh, research seminar on a beautiful sunny Friday. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Leila Isa from the Department of Computer Sciences and Mathematics, who's giving a talk that sounds like an adventure, to be honest. Uh, mooring, orbiting, and drifting. It sounds like a fascinating sci-fi novel, but it won't be. <laughs> it, it's, um, it's a pure mathematics presentation on the ways in which data collection can help us model the ocean. I think there's still an adventurous spirit within this. So I'm really looking forward to your presentation. And when you're ready, it's over to you. Uh, thank you, Dean Jnainati, for this lovely introduction. Uh, thank you, Haidar, for the invitation. So I'm happy to be here in my office and virtually with you all. It's so nice to see so many familiar names, friends, colleagues, students, ex-students. So today I'm going to be talking about um, the PhD thesis project of my uh, PhD student, George Baalini. And George is doing his uh, PhD with the CNRS, which is the Lebanese uh, Research Center, in collaboration with L'Océan Lab in Paris 6 in UPMC. And uh, I am co-directing him with Julien Baja. So I'm going to tell you about his research, but before that, I'm going to put this project in a more general context, which is uh, ocean modeling in our part of the Mediterranean Sea. So Georges' project is about uh, accurately estimating surface currents, usually using physically based modeling and data assimilation from multiple sources, as we will see in this course, uh, in, this, uh, in this talk. I'm not teaching. <laughs> so this project is actually a continuation. This is, uh, uh, this is a paper that is hopefully going to be published soon. It's uh, in its final stages of revision. So that's the paper in question. And we already, uh, we already presented this, um, this research pr uh, project in, a, in an abstract, in a conference, in an EGU conference. And this builds on a previous work that started in 2013 when the Italians decided to give the Lebanese CNRS a boat that they called the Cana boat. I can show you a picture of this boat. So that's the Cana boat. We actually went on this boat and they also gave them drifters. Drifters are buoys, they float, they are smart instruments. Yes, Katya. Hi, uh, your screen is stuck on one slide, which is the title slide. I see. I'm sorry about this. Um, I thought I'd tell you now because, you know, yeah, it's yeah, more complicated. I wonder what can I possibly do? Should I change the view? Uh, so this looks like a PDF document. It is. Right? It so is. if you scroll down, we yeah. should see the next slide maybe. Ah, okay. So is this... Um, Yes, we can see here a text slide, not the photo of the boat. Yes. Yeah. Okay, but thanks for telling me. So okay. but uh, you're seeing slides changing. Okay. And, and okay. Leila, if, if you don't mind, uh, if you can go into full page, full page Sorry. view. Hey, uh, yeah. Okay, can you see the picture now? Okay, great. So this boat was donated by the Italian to the Lebanese CNRS to the Marine Center, and they also donated the drifters. And drifters are these smart buoys that float on the surface of the ocean and they give us their position at discrete time intervals. So in, back in 2013, the CNRS has these instruments and data, and they reached out for help for using this data to model surface currents. So this is how this uh, project, which is ongoing, originally started. Um, another research activity that is related that I'm doing with my master's student, Soha Abdullah, is understanding how eddies mix, uh, mix uh, masses of water, mix nutrients, how they are responsible for uh, transporting pollutants. And an important parameter to understand this is called horizontal eddy diffusivity. It's a parameter that has to do with the unresolved scales of diffusion. So that's what we're trying to do with Soha. And also on a related topic about ocean modeling, uh, there's a very, um, very political, very geopolitical subject and incidents that happen every now and then, which are spills of boats 
So for example, in the Red Sea, it's, uh, it's, uh, it happens every now and then as part of political messages. Recently it happened and we saw its consequences on our shores. So the whole Southern part of our shore was polluted because of an oil spill. And one interesting problem is to uh, know which is the boat that caused this spill, this incident. So that mathematically is an inverse problem about identifying sources of pollutant. And that's another project I'm working on in, in collaboration with AUB and Cast. Okay, so after this overview, I'm going to tell you uh, specifically about uh, this research project, which is about accurate and continuous estimation of surface current in our part of the Mediterranean. So what you see is an animation with a with a trash bag. So we generate a lot of trash. There's a lot of trash in the ocean. There's a lot of pollutant plastics. And once they are dumped from the coast, the, oh, to know where they're going to be, if they're going to come back to us at a different part of the coast, or if they're going inwards in the ocean, we really need to know to have an accurate and continuous estimation of the surface currents. And this project is exactly about that. And uh, this particular research pro project is about extending the application of an algorithm that we developed in 2016. This algorithm, its application was uh, limited to the eastern part of the Mediterranean, which was the area between Lebanon and uh, Syria and Cyprus. So in this paper, we're extending its application. And furthermore, we are objectively validating it with data that is independent of the data that we use in the algorithm itself. So if you want to think about an external reviewer, that would be this objective validation of the algorithm, something external to the method itself. So and the applications of this, as I previously mentioned, uh, this the, knowing the surface currents and, uh, and uh, knowing how uh, the transport of pollutant uh, is going to be has a huge impact on pollution, on the ecosystem, on the distribution of nutrients, on tracking plastics, and on oil spills. Even if you think uh, in the maybe in the future when oil and gas is going to be active in our part of the Mediterranean, the drilling operations where they're going to put the platforms, they better know the state of the current even on a daily basis to know how to operate. Okay, so uh, the, where we're going to start to estimate these currents is to use a widely used technique called altimetry to know the surface currents. So the principle of altimetry works in the sense that it measures the sea surface height from which it uh, converts this, these uh, gradients of height to a geostrophic velocity. And I will explain this later with equations, but for now this is uh, enough to see that this is a satellite-based method where the satellites measure the sea surface height and the sea surface height can be converted to what's called a geostrophic velocity. Uh, geostrophic velocity is the large scale velocity of the ocean. So it resolves scales on the order of hundreds of kilometers. And altimetry has the advantage that it provides continuous and uninterrupted coverage of global surface velocities. That means that at every day of the year, at uh, every maybe 12 hours, I have a map where I have the velocity wherever I want with a certain resolution. And in our case, the resolution is around 12 kilometers. The That's short term. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We, we've just been trying to raise our hand. Uh, your screen is still stuck on slide seven. Oh, sorry to interrupt your flow. Uh, that, it's OK. It's... Can you see me scrolling now? No, I think it's lagging. Uh, maybe it's the Adobe. Let me try to. Oh, open now it. you're on Ultimatry. Uh, OK, yes, it's the full view thing. Sorry about this. OK. Uh, so as I said, the, the advantage of altimetry is that it provides continuous and uninterrupted coverage of surface velocities, but its shortcoming is that it's a very coarse resolution, which makes it inaccurate in resolving short temporal and spatial scales. For example, uh, anything that is below 20 to anything below 20 to 30 kilometers, it will uh, underestimate it. And it's particularly very inaccurate uh, near the coast, within 20 to 50 kilometers of the coast. So um, on the other hand, there's another type 
type of data that is more accurate. And this is called drifters, as I mentioned. And drifters are autonomous in situ Lagrangian tools. Lagrangian tools means that they follow the current. So wherever the current goes, it takes them. And they communicate again via satellite to report on their position at every discrete time interval. For example, they could tell us their position every six hours or every hour, depending on, on uh, the program that launched them. They are relatively inexpensive. And when they are numerous, they allow spatial coverage of the area of interest. Um, this particular drifter, I took its photo, it was around 6,000 euros per drifter. That was back in 2013. But the shortcoming of the drifters is that their spatial temporal coverage is not continuous because they're typically short-lived and their spatial distribution is uneven. The thing with a drifter is uh, drifters is that they just go, they just leave because they're following the current. So let so for example, in this picture, it shows uh, the dialogue between the altimetry and the drifters. So what this picture shows is the trajectories in color, the ones close to the coast, of three actual drifters that were launched uh, from southern Beirut. And this is the Altifloat project. And these are the three drifters that were provided by the Italian to the Lebanese NLS. So th this is actual data. And you see one of the drifters, in particular the green one, hit the coast pretty fast. So it, it died. OK, so when it hit the coast, most often people don't know what it is. They just throw it away. So it dies. The others continue their trajectories, whereas uh, the arrows show the velocity field provided by altimetry, which is available every day. So, for example, so this is a snapshot in time. So if I want to look at the velocity field in, let's say, three weeks from the snapshot, I would always have the blue field. The blue field, I have it every day. I have it with this resolution on this map, but the drifters would have left. So think about the blue one as the committed person, if you wish, and the drifter is the person that just leaves. Abir Sabir bil Arabi. So it's so the, the the algorithm or the assimilation problem is about reconciling these two types of data to come up with a continuous and accurate um, velocity map. Okay. The other thing to see in this picture is that if I were to simulate the trajectories with the blue field, so stressing on the blue on the fact that the blue field is here to stay, I have it every day, but it's inaccurate near the coast. This is what it would give me. If I started at the same place, it would take me to the west, whereas the real data is telling me that I'm going to go along the coast. OK? All right, so now uh, this is an introduction without any math, any physics, uh, any equations. And now the fun part starts. So let's talk about the mathematical formulation of the problem at hand. So um, the first physical process that governs the transport of these drifters or the pollutant is the advection process. And there are two ways to observe this process. We can observe this pro process by being a particle that goes with the flow, and that's the Lagrangian representation. That would be amount to observing the trajectories of a specific fluid parcel, and that would be the green, what's called control volume, or in this picture a control area because it's moving so it's being transported by the arrows that is the flow and contrast this to an Eulerian or fixed grid representation and that's the fixed control volume no matter how time goes by it's always fixed and it sees things path passing through it this is like the professor and the students that move Okay, so mathematically, the fluid velocity at the fixed position, at the fixed grid position, is equal to the velocity of the fluid parcel that happens to be at that position at that instant. And that's represented by the nonlinear advection equation that tells you that the rate of, so the velocity of my position, which is r, r is the position of my drifter, is equal to the Eulerian velocity evaluated at this particular position that depends on r. So I can think about this in an abstract map that takes me from the velocity to the drifter position, so that I call G here. Now, of course, uh, I will need to implement this nonlinear equation, so I uh, do some numerical integration scheme to implement it. And the other thing I need to do is interpolation. So if you look at this picture 
through here. If you have a fixed grid over which your blue arrows are given, these are the, this is the Eulerian altimetric field. And if you have the drifter that is, whose, whose trajectory is in red, they don't have to coincide. So for example, you could be here, you're not at a grid point. So for you to tell what is the velocity, you have to interpolate the four velocities. So there's another uh, process here that is interpolation that takes me from my Eulerian velocity to the position of the drifter. Now, what about the, the altimetric velocity field? Where does it come from? Where does this Eulerian velocity comes from? The Eulerian velocity is modeled. So first of all, it's a two-dimensional field because we are studying the velocity on the surface. We're not studying its variation with depth. And the, the velocity satisfies conservation of mass and the famous Navier-Stokes equation under the hydrostatic equilibrium assumption. So hydrostatic equilibrium, means that the rate of change of pressure with respect to depth is proportional to gravity. So the thing we, I hope we all know from high school physics, P equals rho GH, but that's just uh, now a dynamic equation. And this is the Navier-Stokes equation. It has the contribution of many terms. It has the local acceleration of velocity, which is this term the advection term, the pressure gradient term, and most importantly, the Coriolis force, which is due to the rotation of the Earth, and some friction terms that are, can you see them on my side? They are, yeah. Uh, this is uh, friction. Now for us, um, the altimetric field we're going to consider is actually corresponding to the geostrophic field. What is the geostrophic field from this equation? The geostrophic field is a large scale balance. So if you look at this equation and you do a scaling analysis, whereby you take length on the order of hundreds of kilometers, then the different terms will not contribute to the equation in the same way. Some terms will be more dominant than others. And this dominant balance is the geostrophic, it yields the geostrophic field. And this balance is between the Coriolis force and the pressure gradients. Okay, um, all right. So now what we, we can summarize the forward model as the composition of two things. So there's the advection that takes me first, no, sorry. First of all, there is the geostrophic equation or balance that takes me from a given uh, velocity field to a given velocity field at an initial time that I call u zero to a certain velocity field at any time. And given that velocity field at any time, there's the advection that takes me to the drifter's position. Now, my problem is not a forward problem. It's actually an inverse problem because what I'm observing is the position of the drifters, is this R, this is what I'm observing. And from what I'm observing, I would like to infer the velocity, the Eulerian velocity on a specified grid, which is in my geographical area of interest. So my problem is actually going backwards uh, to infer the Eulerian velocity from observations of the drifters. Okay, now in the literature, if we look at this inverse problem, there are many ways to, to go about it. Um, oftentimes there's a, an approach called the pseudo-Lagrangian approach. And what this does when you have many, many drifters, when you have enough spatial coverage and when your delta t, which is the uh, time resolution of your observation is small, you can simply infer the velocities from positions by doing a finite difference on the, the, on the advection equation. Okay, uh, But the disadvantage of this method is that it's only going to give you the velocity close to where you have observations with the drifters. And that's not always the case. Um, another important class of, uh, of uh, getting the velocity from observation of, uh, of the drifters of the position is the Kalman filter approach. Um, this approach is computationally expensive. And the problem is that the, the, the inverse problem we're dealing with is heavily nonlinear. And so Kalman filter approach is not fitted for this type of problems. Although there are adaptation with ensemble Kalman filters, but we're not taking this approach. So the algorithm we developed falls in, the, in a large class of algorithms called variation assimilation, variational assimilation algorithms. 
problems. So this approach permits a simple mathematical formulation of the dynamical constraints we wish to impose. And it also takes into account global variations of, an, of a phenomena within a time interval. What that means with my actual problem is that I can assimilate or I can use many observations to get one correction to my Eulerian velocity field. That is coarse, that is the blue field I'm, I'm unhappy with. So I can, for example, take a window of observation that has, uh, let's say, 10, 25, whatever I want observation, and all of these will enter into correcting my velocity field. And as I will show you now, when I show you the details of the algorithm, this approach relies on minimizing an objective function. So let's, uh, let's talk about that. So what we would like to minimize in this case is the misfit between the model that takes me from U0 to R. So that is the forward model. So given a certain U0, I can use it with my model that I call GM abstractly to simulate R. And so this is going to be an R model. So this is an R that I obtained from my physical knowledge and my modeling knowledge about the problem. So that's the R model. And I would like the R model to be as, as close as possible to the R observed. And by minimizing that difference, I can infer my U0. I can infer my optimal U0. So it's an optimization problem. Think about varying this U0. You don't know what that U0 is. So you can feed it different U0s. And each time you feed it a different U0, you're going to obtain a different R model. And every time you obtain this R model, you look at the difference with the observation and you want that difference to be small. So you're going to choose the U0 that makes this difference the smallest. That's the idea of the optimization. However, if we look at it like this, this is very nonlinear because the forward model that takes you from U0 to R is very complex. It involves the dynamic equation. It has numerical integration and interpolation. So we know from optimization that you may not even converge in this case. So what's done instead is to linearize around a background known state, which is the altimetric field. So I'm going to say that I'm going to start with this altimetric field as background, and I'm going to linearize about it. So I'm going to take small increments that I call delta u around it. And I'm also going to call this delta u the correction. So basically, if we go back to this picture, so this is the background, this is the delta u that I will obtain, I will obtain with, the, with the minimization. If we go to this picture here, this is my u background, the blue arrows. And by minimizing the, by minimizing the distance between the real observations of R and the R model, I'm going to correct, I'm going to impose corrections on top of these arrows so that they are not, so that they don't take me to the west, but they follow more the observation, they take me to the east. So that's to simplify it. That's what we're doing here. Uh, so what we're going to do the moment we split our optimization problem into a sequence of linearized problem, because, because now when we linearize uh, this, uh, this term is going to be quadratic because if a term inside the square is linear, I'm going to be dealing with a quadratic optimization that I know how to deal with. Okay, but I'm going to do it sequentially because if I, we know from linearization, for example, for my calculus three student, we know from Taylor that I cannot go far from the linearization point. If that H is really big, my linearization is not valid. Take a curve and take a tangent to it. If you go far off, the tangent and the curve are far apart. The closer you are to the point of linearization, the better your approximation is. So that's why in order for you to do it continuously, you're going to have to split it. So that's what this says here. And so this is the objective function after the incremental approach. So let's look at it and let's try to not look at the details, but see that we have three main terms that, um, that enter in this optimization. So the first term is actually going to tell me how close do you want to be to the observation? Because it's a, it's, a, it's a compromise. Do you want to be always close to the observation? That means if you're too close to the observation, you're not going to correct far away from it, but you would like to extend your correction. You would like to extend the range of influence of these drifters. 
So, uh, so this is the first term. It tells you how close you want to be to the observation. The second term tells you how close do you want to be to the background. So for example, in areas where you don't have that many observations, you want to be close to the background. So that's this term. And the weight is alpha one that I put. The third term is actually a divergence constraint for my, who's in Calc 4 here. We're talking about divergence. So this imposes a divergence fee constraint on, on my correction. What does that mean? That means, so when I'm doing optimization, sometimes I can get, uh, uh, I can get an optimal value of, my, uh, of the quantity of interest delta u that is not necessarily physical. I would always like to ensure that the outcome of my optimization is something that resembles the physics of the problem. So because my background is a field that I, uh, because of this, because I start with a background that takes into account the geostrophic field and the wind-derived wind field, and because I know that the, uh, because I know that the wind part can be divergent, whereas the rest of the geostrophic part is expected to be non-divergent physically, I impose on my correction a constraint that says stay non-divergent to remain physical. And the weight I give to this is this alpha two. Okay, so I highlighted in blue the parameters of the algorithm because later on I will talk about fine tuning them. So we have the relative uh, confidence that I give to each term. This is alpha one, alpha two. Another important parameter is the window size that I called TW. So what is this window size? This window size, again, is best seen in this picture. So this is a time picture. This is a very mathematician picture sketch. So this is a drifter trajectory. Uh, the time resolution of the drifter is delta t. So delta t is, for example, six hours. It gives me its position every six hours. So I have that many observation on a trajectory according to this delta t. The window size, this TW, is how many observations I'm going to take to obtain a single correction on my velocity field. So this is time. So what's, what's important to see here is that many observations are going to give me one correction that is constant in time. Okay, so that's the meaning of the window. But to obtain a continuous correction, what I'm going to do, because if I do it like this, for example, if my window is, let's say, seven days, right, I'm going to have a single correction to my, uh, to my background field that is the same for seven days. And then the next seven days, another correction. So I run into the trouble of obtaining a discontinuous correction. So to make that, uh, that correction more continuous, I use a sliding window. That means, so I slide this window by sigma. So for example, I slide this window every day or every two days. And then for a particular point of interest, I'm going to average the different contributions. And I put the highest weight on the window that is closest to that point. Okay. So that's this window and the moving window. Uh, another important parameter that enters in this optimization is through this uh, regularization term. So this term is the term that tells me that how close I want to be to the background is also a regularization term. And what's done to effectively implement this is a filter. And this filter has a length, a length scale. So let's explain it again on the picture. So this length scale you can imagine it as the radius of a circle that tells you how much do you want to extend your correction in space. Because for this particular point here shown in pink, this point on the drifter is going to, by interpolation, going to affect my field at the four neighboring points, if I do a spatial interpolation. But I would like to extend the influence of this point larger, and I do it through a filter. And, uh, and I control how much I extend it through this R. So that means, for example, here, the blue represents the background. The red uh, represents the velocity field after correction to follow better the drifter. Here you see that inside this um, disk, everything is corrected, although they're not uh, necessarily the interpolation points of this point P. But outside of this disk, uh, the correction is not extended. Okay, so this uh, parameter 
R tells you how much you want to extend your correction in space. Okay. So, um, so the first thing you do when you have an algorithm is you want to fine tune its parameters. So how do you do that? So these, this is classically called sensitivity analysis that they allow you to fine tune your parameters. So the idea is to design an experiment that will allow you to do that. And this is the experiment we designed. So we have in this uh, area, uh, this is I think the Libyan coast, if I'm not mistaken. We have three drifters uh, colored in red, green, and black. So what we do, we take two of these drifters. So let's say we take the red and the green. We implement the assimilation algorithm with a background field provided by altimetry with these two drifters. So I'm going to assimilate these two drifters and I'm going to get what I call an assimilated or corrected field. That is the outcome of my method. So I use the outcome of my method to simulate the trajectory of the third drifter that was not used in the assimilation. So this third drifter is I'm going to simulate its trajectory with two velocity fields, the background field, the blue field that was not assimilated and the field that is the output of my algorithm. And of course, I hope that, so I, this is what I do here. So that real trajectory of the black drifter is grayish here. And the blue trajectories are the trajectories you would get by using the background field. So it would, they are really off. So you see it's, it's done over windows. So let's say every three days you have to reposition your drifter. But you see that, for example, this one takes you like this. This one is really off. Okay, whereas compare this to the red trajectory, that is the outcome of the, uh, the advection with the red corrected field, that is the outcome of the algorithm, it's, it's more, um, it follows more the real drifter trajectory. And there is a way to quantify this. There's a metric to see how you're doing. And this metric is the mean separation distance between trajectories. So this is R ops is the black, is the truth basically. And RJ could either be the red, which is the outcome of the method and the blue, which is the background. So you can simply now just quantify things. And what are you going to do? You're going to fix, uh, so fix the values of the parameter and take one of them, let's say R, the length scale and vary it. Take it 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers, 30, 40, and see which one gives you the least separation distance. And you say that in this region of interest, this is my optimal parameter. Same thing, you fix the other parameters, you vary, let's say the window size. Is it a window size of two days, of three days, of four days? So it's actually, this figure shows the sensitivity to the window size. So this is a time series that sketches this separation distance. So this is the separation distance before assimilation with a background. And the three curves are, after assimilation with three different values of this TW, one day, two day, and three day. So they're all more or less within the same range. range. They all offer significant improvement over the background, but we choose the best one, which is in this case, two days. Now, these should not be really taken uh, with this, uh, like this is the two days is the best always. It's more a range of values that works in a certain geographical area. Because if you take your algorithm to another area, you will probably get different values, but you know how to choose them for each area. Okay, so now to the, to the validation I was talking about, which is the heart of this work. So we looked at external data that was not used in this algorithm. And that could also tell us about the state of the velocity field, about the current. So there are many types of such data. Even though uh, the, the, our part of the Mediterranean, which is the Eastern Mediterranean, is much, much less covered and studied than the Western and Northern Mediterranean. Because the, the, the active people that are uh, deploying these uh, instruments and data uh, our part, especially Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, this is really kind of a virgin, I don't want to say land, but ocean in this sense. So it's, it's challenging to get data. And it's even more challenging because you really want data that coincides spatially and temporally with drifters. Because our method obviously is based on having drifters. If we don't have drifters in 
this period in this area, we don't have the algorithm. So we would like to see if there's another source of data that coincides with the drifters. So the first thing we looked at um, are called current meters, and this is where the mooring is. And current meters are ocean oceanographic uh, tools that are moored. So there's a boat that comes and it just puts the mooring. It's a mooring line. It puts it at a certain depth. So it can cover many depths. This specific current meter is at depth, depth 60 meter from the surface. And it's an instrument that measures the velocity. It measures the direction and the intensity of velocity. And it gives it, give, uh, gives it to us as a time series. So we looked at this current, uh, at this, um, current meter, which, is, which was launched within uh, the Egypt program. And it coincided with this drifter that was passing by. So you see the, the black arrow is the uh, velocity derived from this current meter. This is an average over uh, the duration of the experiment is two weeks. So this is an average over two weeks. And that's the drifter trajectory for two weeks. It starts here and it ends up Northwest. So um, we, we, run the, we run the assimilation. And uh, this is what we obtained. So we here we I'm showing you snapshots for um, so the duration of the experiment is 15 days. So I have day three, day five, day seven, and day ten. So what I show you is the uh, the row velocity, which is the blue velocity, the background, and in red the, the output of the algorithm. And this is the current meter uh, velocity in black. So you see how it changes. It changes in direction and intensity as time goes by. So what we observe is that when I am closest, and what you also see in black is where the drifter is at in this particular day. So the, the, better, the best correction is actually when the drifter is closest to the current meter, which makes sense because now my correction is going to be located here. So you see that the red arrows have the same direction as the black arrow, unlike the blue arrow, right? So visually, at least using the eyeball more, we could see this. So here it even, uh, here it's, um, you see that the drifter is farther. So the farther it goes, uh, the less good the, the correction is. So you see that because it's here, the correction is going to be located here, whereas here these points are not going to be influenced. Now you can, uh, as you can quantify this actually. So you can look at the time series for the angle variation. So this is the angle variation of the velocity given by the current meter in black. So this is the truth, if you wish. And this is the angle variation of the velocity of the assimilated field in red. And this is the angle variation for the altimetric field. So you see that the assimilated one is much closer to the, to the uh, observation, which is the current meter. And uh, furthermore, you can quantify uh, you can quantify uh, the overall effect of the assimilation. If you here we're just looking at the direction. So in this picture, I would be looking at the direction of this vector. But if I want to look at the direction and, and the magnitude on the intensity, the L two norm is the is the better metric to use. So you see here, this is the background. This is the difference actually. This is the L2 norm error. So this is the L2 norm of the difference between the background and the black and the assimilated and the black, which is the, which is the current meter. So if you want to interpret this in terms of percentages, uh, because the current meter uh, has norm almost uh, on average 0 0.2 meters per second, this is like 80% error at its highest point and is at its lowest point would be as low as 20%. So you have reduced the error from 80% to 20%, which is very good. And the reason why this goes back up is because the drifter has simply left the region where the current meter is. This black drifter here is going to go away and this is where my observation is. So it's known. Okay. Uh, another type of data that we could validate our algorithm with are called gliders. And gliders, unlike drifters, they're similar to drifters, but drifters float on the surface, whereas gliders, they can go up and down. So they have a sense of depth. So they are robotic underwater vehicles that have triangular type trajectories. That's the SOHUS trajectory. And they dive or climb in the water 
pollen. Now for the gliders, um, even though, so here this picture shows the trajectory of a drifter in black, uh, and that's 20 days almost, and uh, the gliders are located in green. So even though the map, uh, the map is fooling in a way that it shows uh, an intersection, a big intersection between the gliders and the drifters. So you could say that I could use maybe all of these gliders to validate my correction with this drifter trajectory. But the point here is that this picture lacks the sense of time. Uh, these are not found to be at the same place at the same time. And that's what we want. Okay, so, uh, so we, we took one, one trajectory. So if we were to put the condition that I want them to be in this region at the same time, there's one glider trajectory with 33 positions, and that only corresponds to the two days of the drifter's trajectory, not the entire. So I could do an assimilation over two days, the same thing I did. But now my observation, my true, my true uh, vector field is the one corresponding to the glider. Now the gliders, they just give you the geostrophic uh, velocity perpendicular to their trajectory. So they don't have a sense of direction, it's unidirectional, but they have intensity. So what we could do is we can take the assimilated field and we can project it onto that direction and just compare intensities. And this is what we did. So again, this is the, the observation in black. So this is the true, uh, the true norm I want to be close to. And uh, the red uh, time series is uh, the one corresponding to the velocity field after assimilation, whereas the blue time series is the one without assimilation. So you see that it's much closer to the black than the blue. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, a third source of validation is provided via chlorophyll images. So chlorophyll images are satellite images. They're color images. They optically can tell the color of the water. And the color of the water is an indication of which parts are nutrient-rich uh, nutrient and which parts are uh, less nutrient-rich. So it's this contrast that tells you that this contrast in color could be mapped to a concentration. So these are satellite images of concentrations. But we also know that the eddies, if you are in a circular eddies, the eddies are agents of mixing nutrients, okay? So the differences in concentration in the chlorophyll image would correspond to an eddy. So basically what we see in this picture is that I have an eddy that is located here, its center is somewhere here. And I would like to compare again, so I have, uh, I, uh, we can find a drifter that uh, corresponds to this image, which is on May 20, 2006. So this data is provided uh, daily by NASA and their high resolution data, their one kilometer spatial resolution. And again, uh, we do the same thing. We assimilate this drifter to obtain a corrected velocity field shown in red. And we compare that to the, to the background velocity field shown in blue. So here it's good to see streamlines of the velocity field. So these red streamlines correspond to the, to the assimilated velocity field. So you see that it captures, it's more consistent with the chlorophyll images in terms of where the center of the eddy is located and the shape of the eddy. If you look at the blue streamlines, which correspond to the to the background velocity field, they're off. So you would think that the center is a little bit towards the east, southeast, and they're basically more spread apart. This one is tighter. So this is just a visual comparison with a chlorophyll image that tells us that the assimilated field is more homogeneous with the eddy as detected by the chlorophyll image. So, uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, the scope of this work. Now, in terms of perspectives, the results that we obtain actually pave the way for further investigations to apply this algorithm at even larger spatial temporal applications in a wider area of the Mediterranean. So for example, these are the drifters position that we have for the whole year 2006. So what we could do with such a large time series we could be looking at oceano more oceanographic questions, such as which structures are permanent, which eddies are permanent, how long do they last, how long does their energy last, uh, 
So for example, there's a very famous eddy called the Irapetra eddy. It's located south of uh, Crete. And uh, if we run this assimilation over a year, which we can do with these drifters, we could study the mean kinetic energy of the eddy. And the mean kinetic energy has a huge impact on the role that the eddy plays in transporting nutrients and pollutants. So this is something that George and I have started doing before he concludes his thesis, hopefully at the end of this year. And so he looked at mean kinetic energy, which is here. So we average the velocity field over a year, and we either take the velocity field that is, corresponds to the altimetry or to the assimilated one, which is the outcome of our algorithm. And you see that really altimetry underestimates this energy by a lot. So the energy is much more pronounced or accentuated in the field after assimilation. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I can leave room now to any questions you may have. Thank you very much.